Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming to a 10 a.m. start um, to this session of Sensitive Access Commissions. Um, I know it says with Channel 5. They're not just for Channel 5. It's being sponsored by Channel 5. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and on, we have a brilliant, brilliant panel here um, who are all masters of access. Um, and that's what we're going to look at today. We have Amy Flanagan, who's the Deputy Head of... Uh, Factual at Channel 4. Um, she worked, she's about to join uh, the independent sector again, being the creative director of Factual at Expectation. But at Channel 4, she's commissioned the murder detectives, the Romanians are coming, my son Jihadi hunted the trial, and as uh, a producer or exec, um, she uh, worked on the first series of 24 Hours in A&E, Bedlam and Keeping Britain Alive. Next to her, we have Danny Horan, who's a commissioning editor of documentaries for the BBC, who's been there for 18 months, uh, and he has commissioned Hospital, uh, Ambulance, and uh, Louis Theroux, and as a distinguished producer-director, he's worked on series like The Tube, um, Trouble at the Top, uh, and also directed some Louis Theroux's. Next to me, we have Guy Davis, who's a commissioning editor of Factual for Channel 5. Um, he's commissioned Rich House, Poor House, uh, Gangland, The Tube, uh, and uh, uh, a long career as a producer, director, and executive producer for series like The Trust, uh, 999, What's Your Emergency, and Wicker's Wall. Uh, and then we have Malcolm Brinkworth, who's the MD of Brinkworth Films. Um, he's a very long career of uh, many multi-award winning films. He's directed over 57 films. Uh, which includes um, a, a, a series of films with Simon Weston, uh, Simon's War, um, Simon's Peace. Um, he's also exec produced The Accused and Abused, amongst many, many others. So uh, we're going to dig in to um, what does it take to make it happen to um, win, to keep sensitive access going, and, and what are the new limits? There are so many ethical dilemmas that are thrown up um, to filmmakers, to commissioners, to broadcasters uh, when we're making these incredibly difficult films. And it's all about relationships and trust between the filmmaker and the contributor, between the filmmaker and the broadcaster. And there's, so, there's a myriad of relationships going on. Um, plates that are spinning and we're going to talk to some of the best people in the business about how they do it and what are the issues surrounding sensitive access. So I think we'll start off, what, what we want to do is just show a series of clips that um, each of the panellists uh, have chosen and we'll start talking about them and then it'll be a general discussion of issues that are thrown up from those, from those clips and hopefully they all say something different. Uh, and then at, at, at the end, you'll, you'll have a chance to, to ask questions. So please think of questions as we go along. So I think we're going to start with you, Amy. Um, you, you worked on, were you the producer or series producer and director of 20, 24 Hours in a &E? Yeah, so uh, Anthony Phillips and I were the joint series PDs, basically, of the first series of 24 Hours in a &E. um, And that involved everything from trying to get the hospital on board to writing the consent protocol with the lawyers at Channel 4 um, and just trying to work out how to do it, how to do access. So why, why was instead. this different? Because we'd had things like one born every minute, but what was different about 24 Hours in a &E, the very first series? Well, was the well, two things. One was the scale of it. Um, unlike one point every minute where you're in a very controlled maternity ward, so you have basically one woman in one room giving birth and you can pre-consent them and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty controlled. Um, in King's College Hospital A&E department, there were 350 patients every day and, of course, we didn't know who they were going to be. You could, could meet them or ask their consent in advance. There were... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of different staff, both based on shift pa different shift patterns in the A&E department, but also coming in from different parts of the hospital. And then we had a team of about 80, 90 APs and producers and gallery directors who 
were obviously making it, but who also had to understand consent, and then 70 cameras rather than traditional access, which is one person with one camera for a long period of time. And so one of the... I mean, it's, <coughs> it's an old clip, actually, because obviously it was a few years ago now, but what was interesting in terms of trying to work out how to get that intimate access on that scale, um, it just threw up a huge number of ethical issues. And actually, I, I nearly didn't end up doing the job because my dad had a really serious stroke just before we were about to start. Um, and uh, so I spent about two months in Northampton Hospital with him, said I wasn't going to do it. But while I was there, I, and I did end up doing it, but while I was there... It just it, it really informed the consent protocol actually because it made me realise if somebody came if a sort of fluffy AP came over and said hi <laughs> can we stick a mic on you or your family while well, my dad was you know basically in and out of consciousness and we thought he was going to die um, we'd have told them where to take a hike so um, so I think just in terms of our approach and the approach that we tried to build in the whole team just over and above. Kind of the consent and working out how to get the access, we, we, it was really important to try and get everybody to apply their own, just a sort of their own moral um, go to people. I mean, should, should we have a look at yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's, let's watch a clip for 20, 24 Hours in a &E, Series 1. And this is the first series. Was that the first episode? It was the third episode. Yeah. Um, so I think it was like the third day of the whole shoot. Um, when was it made? Five years ago? Maybe five or six years ago, I think. And what were the, probably six? Seven. Just in terms so, of how did you get access to the hospital for a start? So. Um, and how long did that process take? So it took quite a long time. Um, uh, we approached them. Uh, Nick and Magnus first approached them, and the president from the garden. From the garden, yeah. And they said, "Don't be ridiculous. You're not putting 70 cameras in our any &E department." And then because we, this had never been done on no, that scale no, before. No, there'd been lots of access documentaries yeah. to hospitals, yeah, but nothing of that scale. Yeah. Um, and then we went back in and met the um, the most senior uh, medical person in the A&E department, who's a woman called Bryony. And I think, and she was just an amazing woman, and she, uh, the morale was really low in the hospital at the time. And she just thought, actually, it might be a really bold, bonding, exciting thing for the staff to do, to show the work that, that you know, that they all do. But what, what, and she was a real you, believer. How, you, how are you trying to sell it? I mean, what, what did you... Uh, at a time when our kind of public services are, you know, under threat, mm. this is an extraordinary hospital which does extraordinary work, and actually this is a really ambitious modern way of trying to capture what you do, and um, and we worked it out together. And I think she she I think it's really important in any access situation that you have a believer, whether it's an institution yeah. or. Because if you don't have a champion, yeah. if you're fighting all the time, you haven't got one person on the inside who really wants to do it, I think it's always going to be an uphill struggle. But then we just worked out the protocol together. We, we, you know, we worked out with the lawyers and with them what we thought was the right way to approach consent in all the different parts of the hospital. Um, and, and we just trusted each other, actually. We spent about six months in there, and I slowly drip-fed the team of 60 APs and PDs into the hospital uh, and by the end 24 hours a day so uh, by the end uh, day and night there was always a team of our what some of our team in with their team so that by the time the shoot started there were there was still a good chance that um, members of the production team would have a relationship with some people on shift and i think that's really important is that even when you're doing something on scale you still need relationships you still need you know not just top at the top but you still need people in yeah. the team on the ground who you know will wear a mic because they've been hanging out together and but, uh, 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 Bryony was the head of comms wasn't yeah. she yeah no so she was the head nurse oh, Chris was the head of comms okay yeah. okay okay so what I was, what I was going to say actually because I thought she was head of comms is that you, you're right you need like a real champion so in 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 my experience of now being on this side in commissioning is that the uh, you if you've got one person at least one person who's really pushing it and really wants to do it is really brilliant and that could be the head of comms so in the case of Imperial Trust that we do hospital with it's uh, the head of comms there this one Michelle is just brilliant she's really pushed it through 
but, uh, and then and also, of course, the CEO, and similarly with Ambulance and, and reported missing as well, I do on BBC One. But, she, but the thing, I think it's also about timing as well. Mm. So it's a bit like what you said. It's like when you did 24 hours in A&E, it was like the public, uh, public services under threat. And we, we are exactly the same point with hospital. Mm. Is we, the reason why they wanted it, and we just commissioned one about a school series using the principles of, of hospital looking at a 360 about the, uh, the, the cuts that they're facing, et cetera, based in a multi Academy Trust. And, and, and the thing is, it's about timing. So they get, I think people want to do it when they feel they've been massively under threat for years. Yeah, administration after administration, government administration has like cut their funding, and they they sort of feel like they're fe they're sort of fed up. They just like want to they just want to tell you everything, which is allowed us in hospital, and, and a bit in ambulance, but hospital definitely in the schools thing to really just be completely honest about where they're at. And I think that is why we wanted to do the hospital thing. And I I think that's a helpful thing when they you feel like you're going to get real honesty as well. Yeah, I think you have to, you know, there has to be both a champion but also a reason to do it. And what you have to understand when you're negotiating access, as I always have tried to, is sort of what's in it for them. You have to sort of say, why would Completely. they do this? Because if you can understand that and you can live with it and you can work with it, then there's a way forward. You just, yeah. you cannot, what you mustn't be is arrogant enough to feel that you've just got a right to go somewhere because you haven't. But there has to be a, a negotiation and an understanding. And then when that moves on from whether it's your champion to sort of infect everyone else in the, yeah. that you're dealing with, then it becomes a workable proposition. I think that's probably the process. Mar yeah. you know, the other thing I was going to say is that it's also about managing that access because it's not just about when you just get in through the front door and the first bit starts. You've got to continuously... Yeah all the time yeah. monitor maintain and you know because there are people that don't want to take part at all you know they've got to be brought round so it's in a, if you particularly if you're doing something that Amy, amy's talking about here which has got such scale to it mm. it can be the same when you're yeah. in a small institution too you've got the the different personalities it's a long-term journey and you can never ever take that for granted mm. i think in in just in this example i think one of the reasons that we had such brilliant access for the first series is because for all the serious cases, we gave consent over to the patients so that the hospital knew that Co Kofi luckily survived, but um, the hospital knew that if we were filming really, really sensitive cases of very ill or dying patients, um, the family had total control about whether it got used or not. And I think that allowed us to, mm. uh, uh, that let them let us take more risks, I think. And in, in, in terms of. Uh, you talked about managing that a access. The hospital or the institution would have an expectation of what the film's like. What's it like when you showed them the film or they, when it went out? Have you had any kind of... Obviously, there's been lots of positive things about, say, 24 Hours in A&E or, yeah. or all of your films, but, but do you ever have people, once they see the films, they go, well, that wasn't what you promised us at the beginning or you described... <laughs> How does, how does that work? Yeah, it happens. Um, I think that if... I always feel that if you're at a point where you're going to show the institution the film, you should have a pretty good idea of how they're going to deal with it because you've lived that for quite a long time. You know the pressure points, you know the sense of... You know the things that might cause a little difficulty. Quite often with the police, it's the things that you don't expect. It's... it's, it's they're wearing the wrong high-vis jackets. And then they'll go if something else will be completely yeah, sure. irrelevant. Um, but I think it is about sort of um, working out in advance how you play that. And most of the time, it's fine. Because you've, you've been true to what you're going to say. There will be things they don't quite like about the film. But actually, I think if you're, you've got the integrity and the honesty in the way you made it and what you set out to do, then they are sort of points that can be moved around. You know, you can get around it. I think the two, I mean interesting issues. I mean, first of all, you all have your access agreements to begin with, and those access agreements quite often make clear whether they have a right to view and what those relationships are. And that, that, that's one issue. But that's a legal document. That's a, that's, that's a contract. That, that's a contract, that's a contract a effectively, yeah. between you the, as a production company or as a broadcaster and the institution. And that sort of codifies effectively your working, mm -hmm. work, working sort of model. But secondly, also, if you're showing, I mean, an old anecdote, um, and it's partly because I'm so old, but I mean, um, uh, the, I, I first, in the Simon Weston things I made many years ago about the Welsh Garden, who was, who was terribly badly burnt in the Falklands War, you know, I remember showing Simon uh, a clip, and he, on New Year's Eve, uh, he decided um, to drain the dregs out of a bottle of sherry. 
And um, you know, he'd, at that point, he'd, he was almost an alcoholic and he'd got post-traumatic <coughs> stress disorder. And uh, Simon saw, I, mean, I showed Simon and the family the, the film, and Simon stormed out shouting, you bastard, you bastard, how could you do that to me? Um, and, and it took a, quite a while for, I mean, he didn't speak to me for a week, and then he rang me back. And, and he said, actually, thank you. I said, what do you mean, thank you? He said, you stopped me drinking. You showed, put a mirror to m myself. Yeah. And actually, yeah. that changed who I am. And quite often for individuals who you've got a long-term relationship of trust with and you've got access with, that actually sometimes for them seeing themselves in that light, whatever light that is, good or bad, can actually have a, quite an effect on them. So that when you're showing them, quite often you're showing them who they are, that they don't actually know who, mm -hmm. or experience they've had in a slightly mm -hmm. different context. I mean, when you, ha and we'll get on to actually, or, or save that for when we're talking about s when you're dealing with a single subject and that intense relationship, we'll, we'll, I think we'll come back to that. I just want to move on to uh, another medical clip. We thought this was quite appropriate in that mm. you've, you're working on the hospital, and this is the second series of the hospital, which it hasn't gone out yet. It goes out next week? Next week. Do you, do you want to just tee the, do you want to tee the clip up and then we'll just so we uh, it's the same trust uh, the, the channel Patrick at the channel was quite keen to keep the, the sort of brand for a better word going and um, so quickly commissioned after the first series went out another four we could only do four is, is the truth four episodes in the time frame um, and on the third so the first week of filming of the second series of the second series so on the third day was the day of the Westminster attacks. So we should, Let's that's the clip. see the uh, hospital clip, please. So what were the issues around, uh, around that? That's the pre-title, actually. We, we, we went off, uh, we went, uh, decided to do that as a pre-title, not a conventional one. Um, so I, th so uh, because that was the third day of filming, I think if that was our first time, our first series, if we were filming, I'm not, I'm not sure we would have got that accent, I, I think they would have said, "Stop! You've got to stop filming because it's a major incident." We didn't really have we don't we didn't really have a protocol, to be honest, about major incidents about filming a terror attack. I mean, it's sort of a small part of the access agreement about what happens, but we never really had a, because I think we assume that it, you know, you, uh, like six months ago, we assumed that we might not have had that uh, we might not have had that kind of attack in London. So, um, I think. Nobody said stop filming at all. Not, not like, nobody. No consultants. No band managers. No A and E. But you knew surgeon. everyone from the first series. We knew everyone from the first series, which ah. was exactly why we never got kicked out. The only people that said stop filming was the uh, and the, the police, who asked us to stop filming when they brought the perpetrator in, and who, did you, who was treated in St Mary's. And did you ever get to film the perpetrator? Or that, we, that was so. Well, that's it's complicated. So that that was actually there was a conversation about. Which, which has only just been resolved, actually, with the trust about, um, and internally at the BBC, about whether we should show the perpetrator or whether we should blur the perpetrator. So we did film him coming in, um, but, I mean, the truth is he was... Uh, I mean, they tried to work on him, but he was, he was, he was dead on arrival, really. Um, but he was flanked by, by six armed officers, so they're the ones that um, told us to stop filming. So, and, and so, but we had a debate about whether we should blur him or whether it was in the public interest to show his face because, you know, I, or arguably people knew what he looked like because he'd been on BBC News, Sky News or whatever, uh, being treated on scene from a gunshot wound. But um, we, uh, have to, we decided to blur his face, actually, uh, when he was brought mm. in. But that why? relationship of trust. Yeah, why? Because, so it was really... Because you know what, it goes against, it went against our protocol of mm. the protocols of patient, unaccompanied, mm. unconscious patient, mm. um, which means that if they come in and they don't, they can't consent, you, we have to blur them. And we didn't, and, or you go to family mm. for consent, mm. right? Mm. But we didn't want to go to the family, mm. for, it felt inappropriate mm. to go to the family consent. So because, because those protocols are in place, despite him being well known, mm. you know, being known, we thought it was against our own protocols that we'd written with the hospital. So it was, a, it was exactly about trust with the hospital that we'd, you know, we'd put those in place. So we decided to blur it. We, we thought we can't go against that. I mean, when is something private and when is something public, just on a fundamental level? And could you give any examples of films? Um, I think it's one of the central dilemmas, as um, I think that we all face, is... is 
is, is what is justified in the public interest and therefore yeah. you have a public interest defence for uh, and what is actually a private transaction taking place. And I think there are numerous times in, in, in one's films that you, you come up against that dilemma. And I think you've always got to make sure that everything is warranted under the Ofcom code. But also, more importantly, you've got to think to yourself, actually, just, do you feel this is right? Do you yeah. feel this is right for you? Do you think this mm -hmm. is an appropriate use of, of filming and an appropriate use of broadcast? Because you know, we have to take in consideration the privacy rights that are attractive the moment you're filming as well as the moment of broadcast, and they're separate. So I think you know, we all of us, I think, grapple with that daily dilemma. I think it's getting harder and harder and harder, um, you know, I think as, as, as people get more cautious to actually, you know, to actually turn around. Because I think privacy, you know, because there are quite a few um, people that try to mount privacy actions at time to time, you know, that actually restrict your freedom of speech. And I think one of the battles that we will all face in the years to come as we move on, I think in the next two, three years, is actually over the nature of privacy and how that ba battles with the public interest. But that point that you made is a really interesting one, I think, because the um, because he was a criminal, essentially, yeah. but he was also a patient. I know. That's why I was just asking about it, because we have lots of those conversations with custody. Um, so with all the, the, the is 24 hours in police custody, sorry. Yep. Um, and with lots of the crime sorry. stuff that we do at Channel 4. Um, about whether you reveal someone's identity in the public interest because they've committed a crime of a certain level of severity without their consent. And actually, we had quite a lot of discussions, particularly on the murder detectives, because the perpetrator was a young kid, essentially. I think he was 19, maybe. Um, he didn't give his consent, but he, he let him... We didn't object to being filmed when he was arrested, but he was a, even though he'd committed this terrible crime, you know, in some ways he was also a victim of, you know, the place he'd grown up in and, you know, and his life and, and the gang he ended up in um, and was in prison on a life sentence. And we decided we would um, show his identity. Um, but it's a really, and it's I'm not sure point. that's pretty on yeah. the line for me because yeah. he, he's yeah. still a young, you know, he's not a psychopath. He did a terrible thing. Um, and I don't know what the right answer was, actually. Yeah, it's very we did, but but I, we, mm. we fell just the side of the line that, we'll, that we would. Well, those kind of police access series are continually going to be right on that line. Mm. Is custody mm. a private place mm. or is it a public place? Yeah. You know, when you're arrested, you're following a, a, a police unit through the door at that moment in time, and they come off the public highway, and, but then they enter a private space, mm. which is a private home. Where, where does that line draw? And you have to work that, those protocols mm. out really carefully, mm. because otherwise you can end up with all sorts of yeah, issues. And those are channel decisions, aren't they, as well? Yeah. And I, think, I, mean, well, I remember when I did um, 999, What's Your Emergency? The, we had one, uh, I think part of this is, again, about sort of just patience, in a way, because we had um, a, uh, a lady who committed suicide, and uh, threw herself out of the window of a tower block. We went then, uh, she was on the ground, eventually the police tarpaulined it. We were there, we went inside her flat. Uh, we filmed inside the flat, there was a note on the telly saying, please look after my dog, the window was still open. Um, you know, and we weren't sure whether we could use that footage. It was like, you know, should we have gone in even? And, uh, in so the in end, that moment, you're thinking, as a filmmaker, I've got to capture this it. because it went with it. you it was, go with you know, it. With the, with the team, the emergency team who were surveying it and the police who were you know, just trying to work out what had happened. But what we did then was we, we then talked to her daughters thinking, we'll never be able to show this. It will be, you know, it's too difficult and the body was outside and everything. But it took, I think it was um, uh, the series director spent six months really just talking to the girls and getting, you know, really just letting them be. And in the end, they did allow us to use it. Um, and it was a really powerful, in fact, they gave us an interview about what it was like with their mum and depression uh, for the film. And it just felt like that that patience had paid off, that six months, even though, you know, and you can do this with series of that length, just to allow that to ferment and to come to a decision. Uh, and actually, in the end, made a really powerful piece that they were really proud of, actually. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Can we, can we just talk about the vulnerability of contributors? Is it worth showing this? Yeah. some Britain clip? Do you want to explain yeah, what this I mean, clip we is? Yeah, we did a, um, a, a one-off 90 film, um, which showed just uh, TX just before Christmas, I think, um, called Slum Britain 50 Years On, which was, uh, in a way, dated back to a, a load of um, pictures from the 1960s uh, of the slums. And we tr tried to... 
work out a way that there's a parallel story now. So it wasn't about housing, particularly, on the one sense it was. It was about how Britain, uh, how the people who were in the slums, what's the equivalent stories today? Because the slums don't exist in that way today. Um, and so we started talking, and, and Marcel Matasifan, who made the film and you know, has a, uh, Children on the Frontline and the rest of it, and has a great patient way with people and a way of getting to know people, uh, eventually picked a number of characters whose stories sort of made a kind of um, uh, 2016, 17 view of, of that part of society. And um, one of the characters was a guy who was a, an alcoholic, uh, a heroin user, now using uh, methadone. Um, and we followed him and really tried to just get inside his head about what it's like to be at the bottom of the heap, uh, to be honest, and to realize what despair was and what feeling like the system just doesn't want to know you, that Britain didn't want to know you. And it led us to some interesting, you know, uh, drunken um, conversations with him as well as sort of reflections. And then he, in Marcel, and he took him into his world a bit. And there were a lot of stories in the film. It's like quite kaleidoscopic. So we didn't, you know, it's not an hour long film about him. But uh, I think the clip shows the kind of dealing with somebody who's really vulnerable and the kind of sensitivity you need to be able to put those characters uh, with a good heart on, on, on television in the right context. So that's what this clip is. For me, it was, like, it was a really important voice to hear. Um, you know, it's the voice of the dispossessed. It's the voice of people you just don't hear. And I thought that was a really, really powerful piece. And you He's know, ultra vulnerable. He is, and I, I wouldn't have trusted anyone probably but Marcel to do it, knowing how he'd made that film. And where, where does, when you're dealing with the ultra vulnerable, where does it become exploitation? And, and are, you, are you, as a filmmaker, as you as a, a broadcaster, you know, are you you're constantly very, reassessing yeah. that line? And I think you're constantly reassessing it. I think you're, with somebody like that, you're constantly, with Marcel's relationship with him, with Mark, was like, you know, constantly refreshed, constantly keeping in touch, constantly making sure that, you know, his life was, you know, that he was to a degree on track, though he was very unreliable. Um, I think that you do. You just have to, I have to trust the director, the commission, I have to trust the director out there to deliver what is ethically right and what is in the back of my mind and the back, I think, of the director's mind is what is the film we're making? What is this about? Is it appropriate for this voice to be heard in this way and for this vulnerable man's point of view to be aired? And I think that it was right. And I think that he has a, a sort of a dignity about the way he expresses himself. He's much more eloquent in a way uh, than one might expect. And I think what he says is really interesting. And I think for all those reasons, it's right to do it. I'm not talking about Marcel and this particular film, but in general, what, when you have scenes with a vulnerable contributor, say, who's got an addiction, as a filmmaker, you're, you're in a very intense and personal relationship yeah. with that contributor. And do sometimes that they might want to show you something and you might want to film it, but how much are you in some way, inciting that, I know you're just meant to be well, there to document, aren't you? you're meant to be there to observe it, but do you have commissioners going, and what's that like as a filmmaker? You want to see some drama in a film, so commissioners are, are you, saying, well, I, what's the drama? I, don't I, know. I can't believe, Chris, that you're suggesting that there's any pressure from a commissioner to deliver more than... <laughs> is, that, I wouldn't, is that what you're suggesting for a second? <laughs> yes, I don't know if this is true, and I don't know if Simon Dixon's in the room here. To, 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 this is an apocryphal story about um, the boy whose skin fell off, and I think he was there with the filmmaker, and he said, put him on the phone, and then he got on the phone and says, oh, are you going to die? Because the filmmaker had said, oh, he's going to die, it's going to be a great film. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> well, I don't know, it's, an apocryphal. it's a great it's story. True. But... Can you do it in you, our time, please? Yeah. <laughs> the need for drama, the need for sensational scenes, um, and, and the, what, what's the relationship like between the programme maker and the commissioner. You've, you've, you've all been programme yeah. makers, and obviously you three are commissioners now. But well, I, I, 
uh, I, I think it's all about, and again, it's all about trust and relationships. So it's, um, and that goes, that, I mean that with like, uh, between commissioners and filmmakers, commissioners and suppliers, uh, pr uh, producers, directors, and their contributors, uh, whether, and that's whether, this, whether it's with uh, the sort of, sort of drug addicts or whether it's with institutions. It's all, it's all like, um, all about trust in the relationship. But you don't want boring TV. No, exactly. But you also have like really strict e editorial policy guidelines where yeah. you know where we have people who work for the BBC who guide us, and you will have it Channel Four, Channel Five, yeah. where you um, where you're guided by what you can show and what you can't, and you can never encourage. And it'll, I'm sure it's the same at Channel Five that you can't encourage people to be taking drugs. You can only be observing. You can never ever. Yes be giving them money to do it. Just, just in terms yeah. of the kind of the, the pressure that you're talking about, I mean, obviously, everybody wants to make a dramatic, really brilliant, yeah. e you know, and exclusive access moment. film, and uh, all broadcasters yeah. want to show that and capture the moment. But, uh, like, every single access thing I've ever been involved with, and I'm sure it's the same for everyone in this room who's ever done access, that it's constantly riddled with problems and constant ethical problems mm. and decisions and how yeah. far you push something or not and whether you should shoot something or not and whether someone's on board or not. And, the public interest and or not. I think the big thing yeah. is, I mean, I had a big access series go down after hundreds of thousands of pounds have been spent. And it's, I think, because, one of the reasons, I think, was because the production team were nervous about telling me about problems and all the access things, are, you know, on a daily basis when you're a commissioner and commission access things, you have problems coming all the time. That's just part of the course. And I think... It's just really important that the problems are shared with the channel because yeah, it's yeah. normal. And I think when someone's going, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and then suddenly at the last minute it's not fine, that's when it's a problem. You, but but that's true thing, on every level. The other thing, Chris, is, is actually that what Danny's saying is absolutely right. It's all about trust because if you've got a really good relationship of trust with an institution, with a, with a contributor, whatever the access you have, that level of trust is actually going to get, allow you to film s scenes like that. That level of trust is actually going to allow you to be in the room when Dad is saying, hold on, my son has it's been, it's mm -hmm. been fa almost fatally injured in a car crash. Whatever the case may be. So it's, they know you're there. Mm -hmm. They know they trust you, and they know you trust them. And because of that, you are allowed into a, sometimes an incredibly privileged relationship. Yeah. Um, and, you know... Playing with trust and abusing that trust is a filmmaker's peril. And, w and what about films where you're making a film with someone? Uh, I made a film about the Conservative Party and Michael Howard before the 2005 election, and I had a, you know, a very good working relationship with him. The access agreement was a nightmare for, for, for months to try and get it with the Tory party. Then we showed them the film, and then Michael Howard just said, can I have a room? Uh, he phoned his lawyers and he tried to shut the film down just before the election in 2005. Um, there was nothing wrong with it at all. We, we amended a factual inaccuracy about the, his age when he was but at there university. Is a, but there's quite a difference between a, uh, a prominent conservative yeah. politician yeah. and a vulnerable person yeah. in that sense. So but I think you ha it is a, yeah. there is a degree. But, but when you're making here. a film like that, um, I remember someone made a film, um, James Hewitt, Confessions of a Cad, and the last mm. scene was they did the interview with James Hewitt who just took his microphone off and walked out. But by then they'd had the access agreement yeah. and they could show the film. Have you had instances where, uh, and by the way, the film went out in 2005, the Conservatives didn't win. Um, that was nothing to do with me. But um, have you had instances where you've shown people the film and they didn't like it or tried to stop it or an institution's not been happy? I've personally not had an experience whereby they haven't. Yeah. No, I've, I've not had that because I think if you get the relationship right, yeah, you, get, yeah, exactly. you obviate most of those problems during, yeah. during, the, during the thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, there are sometimes people, you know, I mean, it's, it's the weird things. It's actually, why did you show me without my seatbelt on if you're yeah. a police officer? Yeah, you, know, can, you know, we missed that bit. The, 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 it's the weird things that come up and bite you, not, in my experience, yeah. it's not yeah. the major things. I think yeah. also that, that what you do find, or I've found with viewings, um, is that the, quite often... Uh, the people you show it to genuinely, I mean, you're saying this about the, in yesterday's, uh, um, about the trial, uh, when, the, when the barristers watched it, people genuinely get enlightened by, yeah. by the films. It's very, really interesting. Yeah. I'd say, I, that's, yeah. I really didn't know that. And, and they, that's a really exciting thing about, because you feel you've got somewhere. Yeah. You feel in the storytelling and the editorial, you've begun to 
unpeel the onion a little bit. And actually, a lot of the time, people are, you know, are really we interested had, in what we, you've done. Had, I had one thing, actually, which was last year, which was, a, it was, it was actually commissioned as, two, I commissioned as a two-part series about, about sort of housing called, in the end, it was called No Place to Call Home uh, for BBC Two. And it ended up being a single film because one of the major contributors, she, uh, and Luke Sewell was the director, and was filming her for a really long period of time. And they'd cut the film, showed her the film, and she just, she, she couldn't handle it, mentally couldn't handle it. And her daughter, who was also in the film, and so we pulled the film, we didn't show it. And, and the reason why we didn't show it is despite having ongoing access and she was fine, is that she, uh, because we were filming with some of the most vulnerable people around, she, she and her daughter both had mental health problems and they, in the end, we weighed up, because she was saying, um, I'm really worried about my child's mental health. She's, she's going to get bullied in school again. I mean, it, arguably, we, you could say we should have thought about this before, but we were having ongoing discussions, and we thought it was all right. And then um, she was starting to get bullied again in school, the daughter, and uh, we just all took a view that it just didn't feel fair at the time. I mean, we could have put it out legally, right? But I think it's just, in the end, it feels, sometimes you think, you just weigh things up and think, actually, ethically, it's just not quite, it just doesn't feel right. Yeah. So we pulled it, but, you know, that was a uh, two-part series, but ended up being one. And, and do you have, uh, you I was thinking it might be worth showing the, the, the cues. cues. I was yeah. thinking, because, it, you know, that's, that's a whole story. The, the clip um, we're about to talk about is, 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 is a, um, from a film called The Accused. Um, and what that's about is following an individual who is accused of a serious crime. Uh, so it's a long term over you know, many months uh, with them and their legal team. So there's no police access, there's no prosecution access. It's, it's a really sort of core process. And there's the pre-title here, I think, um, which is and it's perhaps worth then talking about yeah. what that means and, and, and how you get that sort of single subject over a long period of time. So what the accused is all about, so I got the clip wrong in terms of where it was come from. I mean, obviously, that's a good example of the, of the of kind of the, I mean, Rob McCabe, who the filmmaker is here, um, and, uh, and, you know, Rob, you know, it spent weeks and weeks and weeks filming um, with Kenzie. You know, she's accused of um, being complicit uh, in the injuring of her child uh, when uh, the child was uh, very young. Uh, and it follows this extraordinary journey of of her and her legal team uh, as, you know, as she goes through the emotional experience of being that. And we took a really clear um, decision not to involve the police, not to involve the prosecution, and not to actually engage with her in anything that would actually break the legal privilege, which is you know, things like, you know, tell us about the crime, tell us what happened that night, or anything like that, because that's not our thing. What we wanted to chronicle was what was that emotional experience. So it's an extraordinary crucible, um, you know, which you'll sort of parachuted into. And then, we, and then the other thing I think was different about it was that actually we did a consent protocol that we actually did. A, um, so every single time Rob and the team filmed with her, we went through consent every single time. So sort of you built up this sort of whole raft of consent. So there was never any question of saying, hi, let's come back to you at the end of the day and show you the film and say yes or no. It was sort of slowly, slowly, slowly because we never knew what happened. Because going back to things that could collapse, that film could have collapsed at any po uh, point. And how long did that film take to make? Uh, in terms of the starting of uh, the genesis of the project, which was started off with a different case, um, uh, which then collapsed, <laughs> um, from, from the time we first started the project till the time it brought broadcast was 18, just over 18 months. Uh, and the time I think Rob spent uh, about five months in total filming with Kenzie. I think over about 34, 35 days. It was, yeah. It's an interesting thing because, I mean, from a commissioning point of view, what was interesting about it was there were all these problems, yet the initial conversation about why we should do it and what it should be was very straightforward. Yeah. And so you had two levels to this idea, both from my point of view and from Malcolm's point of view. He did all the hard work. So it was like... The purity of the idea is important here. Right, this is what we do. We want to follow somebody accused of a serious crime, and we want to go right up to the verdict, and we want the audience to take all those twists and turns through the story, never know whether they're, what the reality is right until the end. So there's a payoff at the end, slightly inspired, I have to say, by the original... Um, uh, was it 24 Hours in Police Custody, where you yeah. revealed at the end? And uh, I just... That was the purity of our editorial discussions, then it's like, 
whoa, this is going to be difficult. But it was, you know, but that was why, you know, when you and Rob really got to grips with it, with Stephen, a, a lawyer, you know, we began to see a way through it. And that was what was so exciting. But as long as we kept, as long as the idea didn't derail yeah. while, we were, while you were making it, because then what you get at the end when you're kind of that rigid and rigorous about what the idea should be is you get that. And that scene is fantastic. I mean, fantastic. You just sort of, I've never seen it, never felt I'd been in it. And even, you know, the other discussions with the solicitors were just like, you've got to stand up in the dock and say this, you know, and oh, wow, that was great. And so I think that was fantastic. We knew, we knew that we could, that could never use the trial because obviously we don't have access to the trial. So you, you're constructing a film whereby, you know, to some extent, you know, you know, you could say, how are you going to make a film that actually has no denouement, <laughs> no, no climax scene, you know? But actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to craft the narrative in such a way that the intensity of that relationship and the clarity of purpose and the dilemmas you go through watching Kenzie change and morph and her lawyers change the, you know, the sort of roller coaster ride you go through. Is she guilty? Is she innocent? You know, is she morally complicit? Is she bullied herself? All become the sort of the engine room of the film. But you're still hanging it all on one character, which is the other big risk that, you know, I think those sort of films take. And I think that that's a really interesting, um, you know, uh, challenge is where you hang a one film on one character. All the money, all the commitment on one character. And what's it like when you're making a film like that, or even any of your contributors drop out and you think, well, you know, they're having a bit of a wobble. I can win them back, and then you try and win them back, and you can't. When does kind of... It's almost you're in a relationship with a contributor. It's almost like your partner has said, that's enough, it's over. When does kind of no mean no? <laughs> and d you as the filmmaker think, well, they're having a wobble. I, ca I, 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 I can get them back. I, ca I can get them back. And have you had situations like that where... Yeah. Yeah. You're looking at you blankly. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. It's, it's horrific, isn't it? Um, and it depends how far you are down the line. I mean, something like that would be a mm, complete nightmare, and that's sort of the end of the film, isn't it? Yeah. But I suppose, you know, and you do your absolute best. But I suppose it's that awful moment where you've had three unreturned calls, <laughs> no text, you know. yeah. and um, you know that there's something wrong. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think we've all had it, but I think, you know, inevitably there's a point where either they will come back on board or they won't, and yeah. you can't, you know, I think we all probably try slightly harder than we probably should. It's quite unusual yeah. to get to that, to that point when you mm. really, where it really comes out mm. of the blue, I think. I think you, uh, and also it depends on the project, doesn't it? Like you're like Bedler, mm. my, um, yeah. I'm doing a single inside a mental health institution with young people, and it's like, you, we just don't have no, it's an ongoing thing that we, I, in, film, in some ways we assume we're never probably going to be able to use their contribution in a weird way. And so we're giving them more power than you would in other films because um, just because of the vulnerabilities and also their fault and also their changing circumstances all the time. So you, in some ways you make us... I mean, we've just recut a, the second episode of Hospital where one of the main contributors, uh, she died, unfortunately, and her partner in the end decided he just couldn't bear to watch it go out. And in the fifth week of the edit, we just had to recut and put another new story in. So people do drop mm -hmm. out, and I think you just have to be sensitive. Every situation is different. You just have to be sensitive to that, I think. And it's a, it's, it's a strange thing to say, but actually you're managing risk all the time. Mm -hmm. and, you've got, yeah. as, and I think whether you're in a commissioning situation or you're, you know, you're as the filmmaker, you're, you're constantly trying to manage you know, that risk so that you lower the, r lower the threshold. I, see, I mean, yeah. there are lots of things that are, get delivered you know, completely finished programmes that get delivered and you don't know till pretty close to TX whether yeah. you can actually put them out or not. And that gets a bit hairy. Um. <laughs> yeah, that was the case with this, for sure. <laughs> and do you, you find, do you find sometimes the film that was commissioned changes in the course of, of making it? During the course of your access, you think, well, actually, there's, there's a different film here to the one I told, and is that just the relationship you have with the commissioner, to, it's an ongoing dialogue to say, well, we started off making this film, I know I sold you this. Yeah, but I, think, I think the most exciting, I mean, the most exciting thing about documentary is that you commission something and it's even better than what you originally commissioned, right? And often 
That's the case. Not always, though. Obviously, sometimes <laughs> it's a lot worse than what you commissioned. <laughs> but, um, but I think, but it does, cha it does change, yeah. But I think it's, a, again, it comes back to the same thing about trust and relationships. So an ongoing dialogue with the producers and the filmmakers. And then, and then so you're a constant dialogue through the production. Yeah. I'm sure you mm. both do this as well. So you're not, nothing comes at you like a bolt in the blue. No, it's no. like you, you, if you're talking to them all the time about how the film is going and the contributors that they're getting and the stories they're getting, I think it should be you're, you're, you're understanding and then you're managing it up yeah, to yeah, the controllers. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, you know, the, the, the bit of a disaster is you, you, know, you commission apples and you get pears. But the, the, what you need to do is, is if you've been talking, that shouldn't happen. And as long as you can still have that purity of editorial ambition, which is this is what we want to do, and there are different ways of getting there. But yeah. you, you know, what you don't want is to surprise of suddenly like, actually we told you it was this, but it's this, which yeah. is much more difficult to do with the thing. It's that horror moment in the cashing room when you actually, you, you watch the first rough cut and you go, this is not what I felt like commissioned, this is not what the film yeah, should by be. By the way, I've had that as a director, I series director of The Tube, when Emma Willis came in to look at it the first <laughs> viewing. She literally, I mean, it was like, she, she was unbelievably stunned at how this was not the series she commissioned. <laughs> and, she, and she had a massive like, screaming round with Ed Coulthard. I mean, it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, it was literally stand up uh, shouting round. I was at the back of the room not knowing what to say. <laughs> I, mean. uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Oh, Moving on. on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Sorry, Emma's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're good friends now. <laughs> we should move on to. Uh, uh, I think we should talk about the sex business right, and about yeah. how, um, to, how do you reinvent familiar territory and access how do you go yeah. um, deeper yeah uh, i mean it's an interesting one because you know the combination of putting uh, a series about sex on channel five uh in peak and thinking you know is this a good idea um will we get away with this um it's you know, the reason i wanted to do it was really because it grew out of gangland which we did last year which is a really successful series <coughs> for us and Paul Blake, who made that series, is now sort of turning his attention to the sex business. And I think we just, uh, it felt, obviously, it's very familiar territory. You know, it, it's, you know, I, I, I sort of had in my mind um, Beeb and Kidron's film about, you know, whatever it's called, um, uh, uh, Hustle, Hustlers, Pimps and Their Johns, I can't remember that title, which I felt in New York, I think it was, did a really interesting exploration of that whole underground scene of the sex business. And I just wondered whether we could look at it in a slightly different way, make it sort of tougher, totally unerotic, totally sort of without uh, any sort of, you know, it can be sensational, but not sensationalist. It, 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 there's something about it that's trying to do it in a new way. I don't know if it succeeded. These are only, this is only some assembly uh, roughs from the edit. But I sort of feel as a germ there of something quite interesting. It's tacking taboo. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. So that's just a, a, a glimpse of it. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, uh, those captions obviously are wrong, but it, it feels like there's something there interesting, um, which I wanted to explore. We'll see how far we get. But in terms of just trying to feel, do something that is, you know, those two girls, they do their tricks between cars in the street. And, you know, this is a very uh, dark world and I just felt it's something that we could explore and we should do it at 10 o'clock and we should be brave about it. We'll see what we get. Um, I think this is a good point just to open it up to questions. We have a couple more clips but let's at this we point see. Well let's see. Is that, has anyone got any um, questions please? There's some roving mics. Have we got the mics handy? Yes so there's, there's one person here and who else? There's one there and one up there. If you want to get the mics ready with those people. So do you, do you want to start? Yeah. Hi, uh, my question's to Amy. Um, with the Kobe situation, mm. I'm really interested about the speed of getting access because obviously you had that phone call recorded. Mm. So at what point do you feel that it's okay to go up to them and say, hang on a sec, there's a, there's a crew in here as well. There's all these people and the, and the horror of the situation. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, the, um, the worst job on that shoot was for the producers who were in Resos, which is where all those really serious cases got taken. Um, there's quite a lot of clever editing, so things that might have been filmed an hour later um, obviously cut in sooner. Um, but we had, you know, the producers would make a judgment. I mean, the, the really complicated thing on that series is that if you leave it too long, 
you know, our cameras are filming. Even if they're filming the staff, they're still filming bits of that story. Um, so you need to tell the relatives that we're there, um, and uh, pretty quickly, actually, because otherwise, you know, if... You know, you can imagine if you're the father of that child and three hours in, someone comes up and says, hi, can you see all those cameras we've been filming or we are filming, this, the, you know, your son's treatment, you'd go absolutely nuts. So um, usually they would, they would just make a judgment every time. Um, but usually within about 10 minutes, you would go in with a consultant first and the consultant would say, they're here, are you happy to talk to them? And then if they are, the producers would try and get a ask if they're happy to be filmed, tell them they can decide whether it's used later or not, and try and get a mic on in the same conversation really quickly. No, I mean, it's horrendous. Um, you know, and, and it went wrong, quite badly wrong a couple of times, actually, on the first series. And one time, you know, well, poor, poor producer um, uh, went up to somebody and the, the woman turned around and said, you know, can you please leave us a name? My mother is having a heart attack. And she was obviously trying to get consent. She, she got it wrong. Um, but it was... Um, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's, but it's difficult, but I think... Go on. So, uh, I'm right in thinking, though, that you do the same, because we do the same on the hospital ambulance, where you're led by the consultant at the very beginning as well, so aren't you, about getting access by the to those people? But sometimes the consultant... Start filming. If the, I know. Yeah. Well, they, they, I'm, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time they ask the question, but the patient's so out of it, to be honest, but we need them to ask the question or just tell them we're filming, mm. you can decide later or not. But I mean, I... I turned into a total lunatic on the first series because I was so scared. And I slept in the, actually slept in, the, um, in a sort of broom cupboard at the hospital. How long? <laughs> for, 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 during the first week, um, for sort of three hours a night, I was just the, had a headset on, sort of was nearly there 24 hours a day across all the shifts because I was so worried that we were going to make a really wrong, bad call. And, um, yeah, which I don't, <laughs> I don't advise, actually. Um, but yeah. Four hours with Amy. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's got a mic? Yes. Hey guys, I'm Minori from Broadcast Magazine. Um, my question is basically, I'm wondering what the protocol is when you've got a subject in one of your films who kind of, uh, after the film goes out, becomes a subject of a, I guess, criminal investigation. So I'm thinking of the Jihadis Next Door um, C4 film, for example. Uh, from what I understand, Mentor is li liaising with the police at this point. What happens with the footage afterwards when the police sort of request, or when they say they're liaising, do you, what, what do you do with that material? Um, it's a Total case by case, yeah. mental nar liaising with the police on that. He wasn't a key contributor. He was in an incidental scene at the back. Um, it's total case by case basis. They, the police would contact our lawyers um, and uh, sometimes they have to make a court order um, in order to get the material, but not all the time. Sometimes we would hand over the rushes depending on, um, depending on the situation. I mean, we never, uh, I was about to say, I thought it was the same for all broadcast session, but we never hand over rushes at all. So, uh, I ever, if the police request it. They can, they could get access to it, though, if they get a court order, yeah. and then in that way they, they could, but uh, we would never hand it over willingly. No, nor us. We'd ever. We'd wait for a court order, but, you know, it, it also you wouldn't unreasonably, um, you know, not hand over given, you know, those circumstances. <coughs> Who else is? Order then, yeah. so, the, so in the kind of in, um, for example, something like murder detectives, uh, there was a massive panic just before the case went to trial, and the police suddenly demanded all of our rushes, and um, uh, we had to prash at Channel Four. Uh, the lawyer, the lawyer, the sort of head of legal at Channel Four. Um, they stopped all filming, and uh, in the end we had to um, just give them a list of, all, of what all the rushes were and let somebody watch relevant bits mm. that might be relevant for the court. Yeah. But what, what, you, what they can't do is go on a general fishing trip. So you would never hand over rushes so people could, you know, the police could just have a noodle around and see yeah, if there's anything of interest. Yeah. There has to be a specific They have to be quite specific about what they're after, yeah. I mean, we've had it on ambulance this series, actually, as well. Who, a couple who, of incidents. Who else has got a mic uh, and a question? Have you got a mic? And can we pass the mics around? If you want to put your hands up for any other questions, so we're ready for you. Yep. A question to Amy. Amy, you know, say I was in um, hospital, my child had been stabbed. What exactly would you say to me to persuade me that it's okay yeah. for put you me to on the film? Good question. Good question. I like this. Um, 
uh, probably wouldn't come up to you straight away. Um, we, a producer would probably come and talk to you and say, we're in the hospital filming this series, um, mainly showing the work of the staff. How do you feel about us filming the staff, you know, you, the, your, the staff treating your son? Um, and lots of the time people say, you know, and in that case, I'm saying, given the seriousness of the crime, uh, not the crime, sorry, given the seriousness of the injury um, and how traumatic it must be for you and for him, um, you know, you can decide at a later date whether it's used or not. It's completely up to you. And some people say, no, thanks. And some people say, no problem. <laughs> um, and it's that's amazing fine. how many people agree. It's, it's, it's amazing, amazing how, many how many people, people agree. agree. Particularly, I think, when it's really serious, I think particularly handing consent over to the contributors. So, handing, so saying to you, it's completely up to you whether any of that story is used, I think makes people feel okay. And I think sometimes relatives, uh, you, know, you, you know, if you're really worried about the health of your, rel of your, you know, your son, for example, uh, and you, there's a massive team of doctors and nurses who are trying to save him or treat him, I think some patient uh, relatives feel grateful, maybe, um, and want, you know, uh, I think some people actually don't really know whether they're saying yes or no in the moment. They don't really know what's going on because you're so shocked, which is why we give consent over to them, secondary consent. Um, I mean, in that particular case, we'd say, well, we need to ask your son if he's conscious. So he would have to say yes as well. Um, but obviously, lots of people say absolutely no way. Um, there's one question here. I can share. Well, hang on, there's a mic. Quick, quick, quick. Just following on from what you just said, I just mm. wondered, um, presumably you don't show all the contributors um, in 24 hours in any um, the films, or you do? Uh, you show all the key patient contributors. I mean, I don't know, actually, in later series, but definitely on my series, we showed every key patient their story, and definitely all the serious stories, um, because all the serious stories um, had to give secondary consent, and that goes right up to broadcast. So we would actually, you probably wouldn't show, you know, someone who's come in and cut his finger on a mandolin, but you talk them through their contribution. But um, you would definitely show them the main patients, uh, but it might just be their bit. Yeah, that's what we but do. You don't show, we, we didn't show all of the key doctors. We showed the hospital because the, suddenly then you're in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of viewings. Um, and I just wondered about the same thing for the drug addict, whether you went back and showed him that film. No, we didn't. Um, but I know that uh, Marcel talked through exactly what we'd filmed, and uh, it's, it's a slightly different type of um, sort of jeopardy there. It's, a, it, you know, it's, not that, it's not where you're in a position in A&E where there is a family in crisis of a moment of you know, a serious injury to a member of the family. It's more an ongoing relationship with that character, which has been over many months. And so we took the decision not to screen the film's contributors or, in fact, to the, uh, the photographer who was involved in it. Um, and we, you know, everybody was, was happy with the film. So what's your duty of care to um, not just the contributor but their family? So I'm in discussions at the moment with a well-known uh, public figure who one day told me his parents were heroin addicts. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, and then, obviously, I asked him if we'd like to make a film about it. But the issues are... Who is it, Chris? Who is it, Chris? I can't say. <laughs> but um, the issues are that the surrounding... Obviously, the whole world is going to know. Yeah. And it, it's, it's not so much about him who's going to be doing the film. It's, it's about his brother. Mm. It's, it's about his sister, who, who, you know, yeah. and the, how their lives are going to be affected. I mean, how, much, how far does the duty of consent, your care to the contributor, but then their families go. Is it a duty of care or is it a responsibility of care? And I think there's always, mm. sometimes there's a sort of slight muddle over those phrases because, yes. you know, we have a responsibility effectively to make sure that, you know, morally and ethically we feel that this is appropriate and they feel that actually it's from there. And we have a duty, obviously, of care to our, the staff and everything else that's doing it. So if they're yeah. putting them in a dangerous situation, you know, for example, you know, in one of the series we make, um, actually, the film crew get attacked every other week, but, and they have to wear stab vests, and they're wearing stab vests every single day they go out mm -hmm. filming. And so there's a huge responsibility over the way in which that, you know, we make that. 
The same is true of when you're dealing with contributors who are in vulnerable situations. You do have a responsibility to make sure that you know, you're managing not only their expectation, but also the fallout behind. Because people have real lives. You know, the, the, you know, our films go out, but their real lives don't stop. And actually, there has a cascading effect for weeks, months, years mm -hmm. to come. And we have to make sure uh, you know, that, that all of that is a, is a real responsibility to make sure that you know, they're looked after properly. Yeah, no, we had a similar thing on, um, or a thing on junior, Confessions of a Junior Doctor recently where the, there was a, I can't remember the exact details, but there was a contributor in hospital who I think had given their consent um, and uh, uh, they then sadly died um, and their legal next of kin confirmed that consent, but then um, the patient's mother, who wasn't the legal next of kin, really didn't want it to go out, and she was elderly and frail. So we don't have a duty of care towards her. She's not a contributor, but you do have... Uh, you do ha it's, an, it's, an, it's just an ethical factor in, you know, will broadcasting this really, really cause you know, a significant yeah. additional upset to a very vulnerable, very elderly woman who's just recently bereaved of her daughter. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we managed to work through it with the mother, and she knew, you know, she, in the end she was happy, and she just didn't watch it. But do you, I mean, the way doctors have a Hippocratic oath, do you think documentary makers should have a, some kind of ethical code of, ethical code of conduct, not a legal code of conduct? Can I go back just for a second on another point, which is that, that there's, a, there's a, dif a difference there when you're making a sensitive access film where you've got that. You know, there are lots of access-based documentaries where people say, I'm really upset, I don't want to be on TV. Now, actually, as part of the film in process, they should be on TV. And actually, distress and privacy are not the same things. And I think sometimes we have to, in the, when you have difficult access, sometimes you have to be robust, and, you, and a broadcaster has to be robust to say, actually, this is in the wider public interest. So it's not always saying, hey, you know, we're going to take a sympathetic view here, we're not going to broadcast this. There are lots of situations and lots of dilemmas that filmmakers and broadcasters may have to face in those access discussions when actually they have to weigh that balance between what is in the public interest I don't want to be on TV may not be enough for that. And actually, it's important that that, that piece is shown. So I think in, going, in terms of your code of conduct, you have sort of various layers <laughs> to it, which is your own, response, your own view about what is morally and ethically right, what is right in terms of the Ofcom broadcasting code, and what is in right actually you think is in the public interest. And you're balancing all those three different yeah. things. And I was kind of just yeah. going to come to you, what you were saying earlier about your son. I mean, in, at the end of the day, on, yeah. on the first series of A&E, and it was partly because my dad had had this really big stroke, but I was teach, trying to teach this kind of massive team of um, APs and researchers about the consent protocol. But I remember saying to them, you know, at the end of the day, you know, just think, is this okay if this was my dad? And it, just apply that filter. Is it, you know, and that's in terms of the time that you go up to somebody, wh when you ask them to wear a mic, do you, just in terms of your general judgment, if you just forget the protocol, it, does this feel morally okay? If someone did this to my mum or my dad or, you know, my brother or me, you know, would I be outraged or offended or... I um, probably would. I'd never let anyone. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all we've got time for. I just want to say a huge thank you to Malcolm, Guy, Danny and Amy, the DocFest team and Channel 5 for sponsoring and producing this event. Can so I just say one thing? That there's a, a session at 2 o'clock yeah. that is with the um, uh, sex business uh, and the latest film in the Accused series, uh, and another series, we're going to do some special 10-minute uh, sections in a session at 2 o'clock, which will be the first time we've been seen, so please do come along to that but if you Thank can. you. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank, Thank you very much. much.